The Shafrir missile series has its origins in the constantly twisting global politics of the 1950s and 60s. Air superiority was regarded as an essential part of the Israeli war plan. Although cannons had been the primary air-to-air weapon in the 1950s, most strategists in most militaries believed that guided missiles were the future. Their promise was to render the dominance of cannons at short ranges irrelevant by enabling larger, faster aircraft to strike from many miles away. The Soviets, and to an extent the French, were willing to supply Arab air arms with missile-equipped fighters like the MiG-19, the new MiG-21 and the Mirage 3. So it was clear to Israeli planners that if they wished to retain their superiority over Arab air forces in air-to-air combat, they would need to secure a supply of the best missiles. As they could not rely on the West for that, they elected to develop their own weapons. The small and immature Israeli weapons industry couldn't hope to produce a radar-guided long-range weapon at this stage. Those systems required tight integration with the avionics of the launching aircraft, and as yet Israel couldn't produce those systems. And in any case, the Mirage 3 came with the Matra R-530 radar-guided missile, one of which could be carried on the Mirage's centre-line station. The IDAF AF employed it with occasional success. What they didn't get with the package was an infrared homing short-ranged missile. Raphael was instructed to start work on such a weapon in 1961. Raphael enjoyed some advantages in this exercise. Israel had some access to the US AIM-9B Sidewinder and understood its basic concept. The elegance of the roller-on for stability and the lead collision pursuit curve electronics were readily replicable. The Sidewinder was, and to an extent continues to be, limited by the fact that it was originally intended to be an add-on kit for the 5-inch diameter Zuni rocket. Raphael didn't have these limitations as they didn't need to use the rocket motor from an existing weapon. The Shafrir therefore has a purpose-designed missile body that is 6.3 inches in diameter. Additional volume gained from this diameter allows it to be nearly 40 centimetres shorter than the AIM-9 B and D sidewinders, 2.4 metres rather than 2.8, and still have around 40% more internal volume. That volume gain was likely useful as, with the best will in the world, it was unlikely that the fledgling Israeli electronics industry could successfully miniaturise everything they needed for the early Shafrir. The additional space also enabled the fitment of a much bigger warhead. The Shafrir II has a 24.3 pound blast fragmentation warhead, twice the size of the 10 pound warhead on the early Sidewinder. This additional power was an essential part of the specification as the Sukhois entering Egyptian and Syrian service were large and tough, and Sidewinder's ability to tackle them with one hit was unproven. Later Sidewinders moved to a continuous rod warhead to increase lethality for this reason. The Shafrir 1 appeared in 1964 and was carried by Mirages in the Six Day War in 1967. It did not, however, prove very effective. Seven were fired in combat between November 1964 and April 1967 and all missed. During the war itself, only one of the many Shafrir's launch damaged its target, but not sufficiently to kill it. R3S Atolls proved more effective than the Shafrir in 1967, despite the total dominance in tactics and numbers that the IDAF AF enjoyed. In fact, it was an Atoll fired by a MiG-21 that had the distinction of being the first air-to-air missile kill in the Middle East. A Mirage was hit and downed by one on the 5th of June 1967. An Egyptian MiG-21 was eventually shot down with a Shafrir-1 on the 10th of October 1967, and in total three kills would be attributed to that missile. When the Israelis obtained some atolls from captured Egyptian bases, and more AIM-9B sidewinders via the US, their assessment was that both of these weapons were superior to the original Shafrir. But having gained experience in the field, as it were, Raphael's second attempt, the Shafrir II, was much more effective. 
Like its predecessor, the Shafrir II sensor is self-cooling rather than incorporating liquid nitrogen cooling from the pylon as in the AIM-9D. A reasonable estimate for the Shafrir II is a 40 degree tracking cone off the target's exhaust. Initially, the sensor was tuned specifically to the MiG-21, which led to issues when engaging other aircraft, particularly the resilient Su-7. Sensor tuning was altered and apparently performance improved. Speed was around Mach 2.1 plus the launching speed of the aircraft. AIM-9D was lighter, more aerodynamic and had a faster burning motor. It could reach between Mach 2.5 and Mach 3 on the pursuit curve and thus had a slightly longer potential engagement range. 6 kilometers versus 4 or 5 in the Shafrir 2. Sidewinder could also be used from a slightly closer range. Part of this was due to the flight control system, which appears to be very similar to the AIM-9B in the Shafrir 2. Israeli pilots who launched them reported that the missile would make large corrections in flight, at least compared to the AIM-9D, suggesting that the guidance system was similar to the B in that the canards were either fully moving in one direction or in the other. This leads to the characteristic winding course of the missile and reduces manoeuvring energy and range. Shafrir 2 was most effective when fired with the launching aircraft pulling between 2 and 2.5 two and G, which is better than the ATOL, but again, AIM-9D had a wider launching envelope. It could be successfully launched above 3G due to its faster reacting control system and externally cooled IR sensor. The other thing worthy of note is that the Shafrir's larger profile led to greater drag, which hurt the launching aircraft's performance somewhat. Actually, there's one more thing. Although our instant view is probably that the external seeker cooling was good, the AIM-9D required a specialised launch rail, including the liquid nitrogen bottle and plumbing needed to supply the missile. Any ground station maintaining the aircraft would also require both a supply of the gas and the right handling facilities. That was no issue on a US aircraft carrier, but it might be more so at a ground base that could be tacked at any time. Simplicity can sometimes be best. Despite its flaws, Shafrir 2 was far superior to the R3S Atoll. Mirages were equipped with a variety of weapons that appear to have come down to availability in the preference of the individual squadron's commander. For example, 101 Squadron used the AIM-9D, whereas 117 Squadron exclusively used Shafrir 2. Although AIM-9D was available in some numbers, because it was made in Israel and included a good deal of local parts, it was easier for the IDF to obtain robust supplies of Shafrir 2. This is an important strategic factor as well as a tactical one. You can't launch what you don't have. Israeli accounts of engagements in the War of Attrition routinely say that Mirages were only carrying one Atoll or Sidewinder because of limited availability, and Shafrir II changed that situation. Judging the tactical effectiveness of the Shafrir II is hard. During the War of Attrition and Yom Kippur War, the IDAF AF claimed a 60% probability of kill, with 89 total aircraft downed in the 1973 conflict. That's three times the kill rate that the US Navy achieved with the comparable, perhaps even slightly superior, AIM-9D Sidewinder in Vietnam. Undoubtedly there has been a deep study of that within the IDAF-AF, but understandably nothing about real performance has leaked out. What do I make of the claim? Well, number 117 Squadron, a, a Mirage Squadron, claimed 23 kills in 45 launches. That would make the probability of kill 50% for one of the primary users of the missile, which is still extremely impressive if it's true. As ever, we do have to be careful with claims about substantiating evidence in the case of kills. I've read as much pilot testimony of individual engagements as I can get my hands on, and I can't quite get to the 60% figure. If I assume that all of the Israeli claimed kills are in fact kills, then I get to a 33% kill rate after trigger pull. That accounts for missiles that malfunction in some way, even on the pylon, as well as those that track but miss. As for the likely statistical accuracy of claims, that is a wider topic for another day. 
To conclude on the Shafrir II then, it's an amazing achievement. The Soviet Union failed to produce an indigenous infrared homing AAM design until the R-60 AFID emerged in the mid-1970s. The Atoll is, of course, a copy of the Sidewinder. The only other nations to produce an infrared homing missile before then were the UK and France. The RAF's fire streak is probably the most technically impressive weapon of the bunch, but it's completely untried in combat, so we don't know where their paper performance translates tactically. The Matra Magic was pretty conventional, but better designed for export than the typically gold plated and proprietary fire streak. And again, we don't have a huge amount of information about the effectiveness of early models. Shafra 2 was further developed into the successful and long lasting Python series variants of which remain in service in numerous air arms. It is also the basis for the PLA's standard air-to-air missiles. It is therefore part of the origin story of the world-renowned Israeli weapons industry. For Israel to have joined the most technically advanced aerospace industrial bases in the world in the 1960s is tantamount to the ingenuity of the engineers at Raphael, the skills of the Mossad, and the determination to survive in a region that wanted them gone.